How about meta questioning, Nick? Yeah. Bring it on, bring it on, JK. Let's do it. Meta questioning, bring it on. I'm ready to be meta questioned. Meta questioning? Yeah. What is it? Can you want to tell Teresa what it is? And can you can you also incorporate the new behaviour generator, which is essential to most. If you can't do any other processes, new behaviour generator is the one to do with everybody for everything. Can you explain why, Nick? Save my voice, thanks. I think that's actually appropriate to what we're learning today. Yeah. Even if it was a roundabout personal way. So meta questioning is while you're building rapport with your clients, you're getting to the infinite, infinite detail of the problem, not just their scripts. You're trying to work through that, that bullshit, that surface bullshit, which is a level that people think at in their conscious to get behind that and understand a lot more detail about when it happens, why it happens, not just listening to the scripts that you're given. That's probably not a very good explanation, but does it cover most things, Jenny? Yeah, and it, it is from uh, Dave Elman again. It's the uh, the direct model. So um, quite often we go around the houses to put the person into a relaxed state, but meta questions when you go for the jugular. Yeah, so as an overview, I'd be I'd terrible at that. You get, you get to understand what is really happening, what they need, and why. So you, you kind of get them to go more into the detail and the outcome that they want and things like that. So we'll say why to each other, but to them we'll say, for what reason? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, so for what, for what reason? So what if they don't know for what reason? Like I played this game yesterday with somebody and they said, well, if you did know, what would be the reason? Oh, this is a very interesting one. I've used um, with Verity, and I, I always think I'll be caught out, and I never am. The only way I'm caught out it will be with somebody like Nick, or probably yourself as well. I think I've used it with you, though, actually, in the early days. If somebody says they don't know, you ask them a direct question. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. And then you, you lower your voice, and you look at them steadily, and you say... If you did know, do you know they always answer? Yeah. They always answer. So that you re recognise that the first thing is a kind of a throwaway comment to, to get out of the radar. And so when they know that you mean business, they will answer. And then they usually say, oh, I've never told anybody that before. Right. So do you believe that everything is, all the answers are in them? Yeah. 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 And it's connecting with them. Right. You don't know the answer. I mean, as much as you've, you've got insider information, Teresa, I know, but the answer is coming from them. If it doesn't come from them, if it doesn't come from them, some part of them, they might pretend that it's worked, but they won't make it work in their life. They'll just do it to stop you going on. Right. No, nobody ever does that. Um, <laughs> so what do you think the difference is between subconscious and the higher self? Conscious mind, right. subconscious, unconscious, superconscious, higher conscious. They're just levels. Okay, so would you have to be deeper to access the higher conscious or do you think that? No, you can have inspiration while you're waiting at the traffic lights in the car. Okay. It, it all depends on clear communication, a gap, a micro sleep, an opportunity. Well, the person is receptive quite often through exhaustion. So in your higher conscious, so would I say in your higher conscious, what would your higher conscious say? Would that be enough to pull on them if I was asking them if they knew? I don't think many people would. It depends who the person is. Okay, so I'd have to do something like that in trance. I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't be able to do it necessarily. Richard Bandler does. Richard Bandler is one of the 
developers of NLP. It was Richard, Richard Bandler. Bandler. Richard Bandler. Um, you, you really have to watch some of his videos because I'd be very interested in your opinion. Okay. Richard Bandler, John Grinder, and John Laval. They developed NLP by studying these various therapists. This is what okay. Richard Bandler does. I've learned a lot from him because okay. I didn't like him. That's why I've learned a lot from him because I didn't like him. Huh. And so I watched everything that he'd ever done. I saw the various physical forms of himself because he's changed rapidly over the years. And it was when I was put into situations where I had to use some of his techniques and they damn well worked that I realized, yes, this NLP stuff's good and it can be put into a more spiritual um, concept, if you like. Yeah, um, I think it's the guts of it what I'm looking for, actually. He would say, but bearing in mind you've got usually no idea of the person's belief system, right. he would say something like, um, <laughs> Well, I just thought about the suicide one, actually. Some of his phrases are quite good. If somebody said, um, um, oh, past life. Um, do you believe in past lives? And he'd say, I'm not really sure I believe in this one yet. <laughs> I've got some really good answers. Um, but I've seen comedians do it. You know, uh, you probably don't know if they're in Canada, but Nick will know. Noel Fielding. Um, it's Noel Fielding. There's uh, there's many comedians. Watch stand-up comedians, and the good ones will do a gestalt right in front of your eyes. I really think we need to introduce gestalt at the moment. They do a gestalt right in front of your eyes, where they will enact two characters or two points of view by actually walking to the other side of the stage. Or tilting their head in a different way. So what Richard Bandler would do in the situation you've just described, the person would say, no, 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 what? I don't know. And you go, if you did know. And you go, blah, 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 blah. And somebody can go into trance just like that because they're attempting to access another part of the mind that is not conscious. So think about the levels of consciousness and how it's measurable, blah, 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 blah. Isn't important to them. And they could not really understand what you're getting at. So the way to explain there are all these different levels of mind blah, 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 is to just change your body posture. Remember, if you've got rapport, so if you did know, oh, blah, 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 and just let them go on, and they'll give whatever answer they think is appropriate. And at that point where they truly don't know, so, what does the other mind think? It's really weird the way they answer. So you could say, um, the first time they say they don't know, if you did know, and then uh, you could, in any way you want to phrase it, and you'll know what's appropriate, they could just lean to one side and ask the question again. What, what does the other version of you, what would your past self say? What would your future say? What, what would the part of you that cannot fail say? Do the analog marking? What would the part of you that cannot fail? Yes. I like that a lot. Because people don't seem to go with it or they blank it out. Um, things that they've all ordinarily encountered, like the successful part of you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it's something that they haven't heard phrased in that way, like um, Descartes, Cartesian logic, you'll find quite a lot of that in the Enneagram book that you've bought. If you start using the meta questioning, as Nick said, and then move into the um, what would happen if you have this thing that you want? What would not happen if you had it? 
What would happen if you didn't get it? What would happen if you got it tomorrow? What would the wife think about that? What would not happen if you did have it? What would definitely happen if you didn't get it? And asking the same question in, in different ways. I like that you included the wife because that's often such a big deal as the spouse's opinion. Mm. Hey Nick, you muted? Yep. And do you want to continue with your meta question? Um, <clears throat> so I thought I'd explain enough. Is that not, did I not give enough detail? Thank you, JK. I've never seen you wiggle your nose like that. Do that again. <laughs> the warlock in him. It's very much like bewitched that was. <laughs> so, uh, in, in the meta question, you can also begin to understand people's language patterns, which you can use during hypnotic trance induction. Right. So, using the words that they give to you, like easily, comfortable, all these different words that you hear from them you can start repeating back to them in trance, which will help you connect to their unconscious in a, in a much stronger way, which will help them get into a trance induction much more quickly. Absolutely right. And that really needs to be underlined. When it's their language, when it's their language, like being on the logical levels when I told you about the guy that was arguing with me about the job, when it's their language, they realise at some point that you're just repeating back what they've already said. And because they're, remember I told you at the beginning, they come to see because they're, they're at war with themselves. If they're at war with themselves, that war within them starts to rage outside of them. And that's when, on a, on a subtler level, that's when people say, well, you know what it's like when you... So when they stop kind of... Um, when they've got that kind of slap across the face from the therapist when the therapist stops agreeing with everything that they said because rapport is established and they um start to move into meta questioning then if the person you're doing it in front of a group the person doesn't or realize they're a rabbit in the headlights trapped in the corner they'll then turn to the audience or to the uh, rest of the group to enlist their help and that's when people do what Nick's doing and just kind of sit back. <laughs> like the blue touch paper and sit back. <laughs> but meta questioning, I've seen death by meta questioning. I really have. What, oh, literally? Oh, God. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a very nice way to die. <laughs> no, it's horrible. I've seen um, when a, a therapist thinks they have the answer. And they just go on and on, and the person just gets more and more distant. When the idea of rapport is, as you know, you meet the client where they are, and there's a dance. So you lead, and sometimes they lead, and you're doing this to and fro. But if you really strategically hold to your meta questioning, and the person doesn't want to play because you've lost rapport with them and you don't soften and bring them back and then go direct again, etc. cetera. You, you just, the person will disappear right in front of your eyes. They'll physically be there, but they've left the building. And they'll say, like a child, they, they'll say everything that they think you need to hear to shut you up. And I've seen it happen on stage. People have actually held a spider and all sorts. But they've still got the phobia afterwards because they've really been bamboozled temporarily into compliance. So real therapy is when there is a meeting of minds and the, there is true compliance. As you know, the, there's no coercion really in spirituality. There's no um, force applied, there's encouragement. But until the person, like with all healing, until the person accepts the healing, the change doesn't occur. So your job as a therapist is to, and 
and NLP is beyond the bounds of therapy. It isn't just therapy. It's a strategic map of communication, communication with oneself, remember, and also communication between the self and the environment. And then you've got your belief systems and your skills and abilities and your behavioral sets of your identity, etc. You've got all this other stuff, which is kind of ethereal, but you are planted in your environment. You have a relationship between you and your body, your body and the environment, the wider environment. That's what I did a brilliant speech. It's very short, again on YouTube, at a business conference in Jersey. And I said, the, uh, your prime directive is your relationship with yourself, your world, and then your business as it was a business world. And you need to have the anchors within your immediate environment to support yourself before going out into the wider world 